Welcome everyone. We're just getting the last coffee drinkers inside. Thanks for coming, all of you. We're extremely pleased to see so many of you who looked at the invitation and thought it would be interesting and relevant. I promise we will try to produce something in the next two hours that mimics that. So, and now the door closes. Okay, so essentially we'll have a lot of, uh, there's a lot of room up here in the front if you want, instead of those small stools. <laughs> so we'll have a set of different talks around this broad umbrella of political technologies around the globe. So essentially we thought it would be very interesting to try and highlight the globalization of political technologies, i.e. the spread of these far from where they perhaps were developed, but also their increasing existence in all corners of the world. And I'll get back to what that is uh, exactly means. So we were driven by, in Danish we would say uh, three-step rocket, but I would say four-step rocket because there are four uh, four main reasons for why we thought it would be great at this point in time right now, more of sort of a practical thing. The first one is that uh, together with my colleague Fleming, who will speak in a little while, who is Russia expert and expert on the weaponization of information, we can say, uh, and myself, I usually, or I come from sort of traditionally the side of development policy and development finance. We thought we'd bring our talents together. And so we published the policy brief in the early fall of last year that you can find up here and also online where we just uh, sort of try to I outline the impact of the glowing of the growing globalization of uh, political technologies and then in the short span of sort of a month a report was published by Oxford Internet Institute on the global disinformation order you'll hear more about that one and you'll also hear more about the third one that came out also in a very short span of time like these other ones from Stanford Internet Observatory that Shelby, who we will be talking in a little while, spearheaded on Russia-linked influence operations in Africa. So all of these things converged around the idea of the globalization of political technologies and then to be very self-centered, there was a fourth, which is that uh, 10 days ago I published, together with my brother who's a journalist, a new book called Forbannet Framskridt, Cursed Progress, I guess, is the best worst translation you can make into English. The subtitle reads, Portrait of a World Where New Technology Impacts or Changes the World for Billions of People, which tries to discuss, run through some of the main fields where new technologies, emerging technologies, will have a strong political, socio-economic also impact. And so these four things brought together is one of the reasons why we wanted to invite you all to this seminar today and I'll give just a very broad introduction to this field and then we'll dive into more specifics of it. I want to start somewhere essentially where we also start in the book and that is a picture here of uh, Khaled Said, not these two kids but the, what do you say, the mural in the background, the street art which is a picture depicting a young Egyptian man who was beaten to death by Egyptian police in 2011 and whose death sort of helped kickstart what we now know would came to be the Arab Spring. The sort of start of a decade in which social media in particular were hailed as new political technologies for the benefit of everyone, for the benefit of democracy. And that was the beginning of the decade. Then along the way came, of course, attempts at influencing US elections, UK elections and many other elections. And then we sort of juxtapose this to what happened towards the end of the decade in Myanmar. These are nationalist Buddhists holding a sign that says supporters of Rohingya, our enemies. And of course, the case from Myanmar was that hate speech delivered on Facebook by Burmese soldiers in the hundreds, most of whom were trained in Russia on social media manipulation, 
help to create an atmosphere that justified the genocide against the Rohingya refugees. Burmese soldiers would sit outside Yangon and create fake social media accounts as though they were celebrities or they were local news outlets and cook up tens of thousands of stories, misinformation, i.e. fake stories about how Rohingya people were murdering, abusing and so forth, raping uh, Myanmar, Burmese people. So those two pictures juxtaposed each other or against each other very well sort of situates, situates the place we're in right now, right? We stepped into the prior decade with a great belief in the democratizing effects of social media in particularly, but left that decade perhaps a little bit disillusioned because of the yeah, tragic impact that social media had uh, elsewhere. So what is political technology? Now that we use it here, I'm sure Fleming can talk more about this, but political technology as a term is actually something we don't use too often, but is something that very much belongs to the Soviet era and to the Soviet Union, where they were very explicit, is probably a wrong word to use in the case of the Soviet Union, but they were very conscious about what a political technology was. For them it was essentially instruments of manipulation. So manipulating information and so forth for the sake of controlling populations and controlling messages both inside and outside the Soviet Union. Today we would probably say that political technology more sort of doesn't necessarily have to be technologies that are developed with a political aim, but it is or technologies that have a profound or a striking political effect somehow, able to influence political matters, supporting governments in power, but also challenging political orders, existing political orders, impacting everyday attempts at using technologies to or for surveillance, for controlling populations, for mobilizing funds, if you're an insurgent group and so forth. So not only state actors, but increasingly also uh, non-state actors. And it also, of course, this idea about a political technology speaks into this old, old, old discussion of whether a technology is in fact a piece of dead hardware or software, something that only gains a political nature once we use it for good or for bad, so to speak, or whether there is an inherent quality to technologies just as they exist on their own. Usually the way I sort of go about it is to say that it's, it's a bit of both, right? That on the one hand, as users of technology, we're able to manipulate them in different directions, but also that all technologies are developed with ambitions that may be political, that may be social, that may be economic. Now what we want to do today, of course, is talk about, well, what happens when these technologies they spread across the world into all corners. And that's one thing we'll learn about in a short while, namely that the report brought forward by Oxford that Emily will talk about shows very well that in 2017, 28 countries were affected by organized attempts at manipulating social media for whatever political effect. And in 2019, the number of countries exposed to such manipulation attempts were far past 70 as far as I remember it. So a massive increase in 2019, as we've also written elsewhere, all African elections were exposed to fairly extensive amounts of uh, social media manipulation resulting in violence many places. So, we used to think perhaps as political technologies as something that was very sophisticated, that was inaccessible, that required a huge amount of skill, and that was own or something that was only uh, or belonged to states and strong states at that. And and this next picture, of course, is not a fancy emerging radical new technology. It's a very old technology, but it's one whose story sort of tells very well where we seem to be going with new technologies and their. Uh, sort of spread around the globe. So the AK-47, of course, I'm sure all of you know it, a sturdy, effective weapon that is fairly cheap or relatively cheap at least and can be used by many, by most people, which has over the past 30 years spread to all corners of the world and executed 
heads of government and executed also revolutions and genocides many places. But there's one thing about the AK-47 that's interesting when we talk about these things today, and that's the idea of accessibility. That what we're rea really seeing is a difference, or a development at least, where many of those political, newer technological, uh, political technologies are increasingly becoming accessible, right? So think about something like drones. Ten years ago, used to belong mainly to great powers, being developed by great powers, employed mainly, if only, perhaps by the US. Hugely expensive, and some of them, of course, still are, requiring an, uh, an immense amount of technical skill to be launched. But we're also seeing a time now where drones can be accessed by anyone where all of you in this room can go to a drone store when we're done today and buy a fairly sizable drone that is capable of surveillance, that is potentially capable of being armed if you choose to do so. So there's a strong accessibility about this. And the same can be said about sort of social media as a form of political technology, that services surrounding the use of social media for manipulation, for political manipulation or for political aims is becoming cheaper and cheaper. And it's becoming also practiced by groups all over the world, meaning you most likely can find access to someone who wants to satisfy your needs in terms of what tasks you want to have done without questions being asked except for the price. So that's, of course, a striking difference. So what we'll be exploring today is what happens when some of these technologies, they spread, they affect populations, they affect countries in all corners of the world. And... Just to give you a sort of red line through what it is we'll be hearing. In one minute from now, I will ask Fleming, Spillersmål, who's a senior researcher at DIES, to come up. And he will talk about, uh, as I said, he's an expert on Russia and on uh, disinformation campaigns and the weaponization of information. And Fleming knows a lot about the mechanisms and the effects of these types of political campaigns or what can you say disinformation campaigns for political aims on social media he will talk about that on information operations in the digital domain and then Emily will come and talk uh, about the global disinformation order as I talked about the Oxford Internet Institute report launched in the fall from that we'll sort of move into a specific geographic space we can sort of say uh, and also related to Russia because Shelby who's here from Stanford We'll talk about um, Russia-linked uh, online influence operations in Africa and give cases of operations there very specifically. And then we'll jump to something which doesn't necessarily have anything to do with social media, but I've asked, or oh it will, Pierre, Han Pierre he's uh, nodding his head, that's fine. But I've asked Pierre Schouten also, who's a senior researcher at DIES, to come up and try to sort of give us some of his observations about the political nature of some of the technologies he faces. Pierre has done a lot of work with uh, rebel groups, insurgents in Congo, but has also just returned a few days ago from uh, South Sudan, outside of uh, Juba. So he'll bring us some of those uh, interesting observations. After that, we'll have a short time for questions, but I would also rather have you maybe save some of the questions for a, a better dialogue, because we will try to move those who would like to outside and have a glass of wine before uh, people eventually leave. So we'll have some questions. Think about if you have something to ask, we can have a round here, and then we'll move out and have a glass of wine or a soda or whatever you want. And you can browse through this new book. <laughs> and there are a few uh, pieces for uh, purchase as well. I don't really make any money from it. It's just so without further ado, Fleming, the floor is yours. Thank you for this, and uh, thank you for the invitation to uh, to join all of you today to speak about this very important uh, and interesting topic. So I'll be saying a few words about information operations uh, and the digital domain. So let me just situate this within a broader context. I'm not speaking specifically about disinformation. I was asked if I would say something about disinformation. It's important that we 
understand that a lot of the, th the information that we are confronted with now is not necessarily disinformation. And I define disinformation as intentionally wrong information. So there is lots of disinformation, but there is also a lot of regular information which is used very instrumentally for instrumental purposes to achieve certain political effects. Uh, some of you may have seen the case unfolding earlier today about Posten and the cartoon, and I was just had a conversation with the journalist who was interested. This has to do with the Twitter storm uh, that suddenly appeared against Posten, and he asked whether this is disinformation. I said, no, it's not disinformation. Uh, I don't see anything in this which is disinformation, but it could be a kind of influence or uh, an information operation designed to achieve certain things. So I'll be speaking about information like in a broader sense. We could go into disinformation, I'm sure. We'll learn more about this also. And then I speak about information operations, and later you'll hear about influence operations. Information operations I see as a subcategory of influence operations, and the idea behind information operations is to use information to achieve certain things. So there has to be a conscious effort. You need to be able to identify some kind of effect, a hoped for, a desired effect uh, by the end of the operation. You use information uh, to achieve that. So just as to situate it within some of um, some of the uh, lectures you'll be, uh, presentations you'll be hearing later. So it really has to do with how to shape the preferences of voters. Now, Adam talked about political technologies, the instrumentalization of of uh, certain tools, including, for instance, the internet and information that you can gain through the internet. Uh, and I'm particularly interested in how to shape the political preferences of voters, how to make voters uh, vote in a particular way, how to make them take part in a referendum and vote either yes or no, or how to make them abstain from taking part in a referendum, or how to make them vote for a particular candidate or a particular party. And we now know a lot about this, and people are looking into this, they're researching how it's done. I have a few examples, they are from Russia. I'm not here to speak about Russia, but I use the examples from Russia because I'm more familiar with them and because some of the thinking that we see in Russia today is really interesting and it's really advanced. And so it's quite interesting to just sort of give you a glimpse into the thinking about how to use these political technologies to influence voters. So I'm particularly interested in the political preferences of voters but we should also keep in mind that you may use these operations not to influence voters as such, but to influence people. Let's say to uh, rise against a minority group within a country. You don't have an election. They're not asked to vote, but you would like them to rise against a minority group and perhaps cause friction within, uh, within the state. Perhaps you would like to unleash a genocide, whatever it is. And you can use those political technologies. So I'm looking specifically at, at voters in some of the research that I do, but it could be broadened out and you may look at uh, preferences of people, uh, including those against minority groups, for instance, within their own countries. Then I also speak about different domains, um, and it was part of the, uh, the title also, the digital domain. Most of you will probably know it as the cyber domain. I refer to it as the digital domain because I would like to emphasize this is where we keep our digital infrastructure. So some of the research that I do is on, is on vulnerabilities within our digital infrastructure and about digital resilience and how to build up resilience and how to maintain that. So I refer to it as the digital domain. But most of you probably know it as the cyber domain. And I look at three domains in the work that I do. So we have a physical domain, we have a digital domain, and we have the cognitive domain. And the work that we are looking at today, of course, takes place within the cognitive domain. We are interested in how to influence people to behave in a particular way. We may use this, try to attempt this uh, through the physical domain. Uh, we've seen examples, for instance, of demonstrations, orchestrated demonstrations. Uh, we've seen examples of demonstrations conducted uh, in foreign countries, but they were organized and paid for by other states. This is also an attempt to influence people. And then, of course, we have the digital domain, which uh, where we find uh, the internet, we find the social media, we find this enormous amount of information that we can harvest and we can use uh, to influence people, and it's super, super interesting. Now, I've highlighted just two of these domains now, the digital and the cognitive, and this is because a lot of research is now focusing on how to combine these two domains. 
how do we use the digital domain and all the information that we can get in the digital domain to influence people? Now, we've had political technologies and attempts to influence voters, of course, for as long as we've had politics. But there is something new. There is a new quality to it. And the new quality is that we can now harvest much more information than we could just a few years ago. And we can use it very instrumentally to try to influence people. What is interesting also is that we now, through the digital domain, have access to the cognitive domain in a different way. Because we, we store data from our cognitive domain in the digital domain. So if you open your computer, it contains a lot of information about how you think about the world, what your preferences are when it comes to holiday or politics or cultural events or whatever. And it may be harvested, ha harvested through the digital domain, but it's actually something which belongs to the cognitive domain. So in a way, the two domains are, are sort of mutually reinforcing in a way. We get information from the cognitive domain, we, uh, we process it in the digital domain and we send it back to the cognitive domain in the hope of, uh, of influencing people. And sometimes I refer to this as, as the big bangs of the digital and cognitive domains. Uh, it refers mainly to the digital domain, of course, which is expanding. And, and the image that I often use is that if you imagine yourselves now sitting inside the digital domain, there's a big bang in the sense that the walls are expanding. Major actors, and these are states, because states have more resources, major actors are rushing towards the corners because they would like to be the first to arrive. But the point is that no one will be arriving at the corners because the digital domain keeps expanding. But states would like to be the first, they would like to lead the pack because it gives them a better understanding of how to use this instrumentally, but it also gives them a better sense of how to protect themselves within the domain. So it's expanding very rapidly. We have new technologies, artificial intelligence, for instance, that would help us uh, harvest data and process data in this domain. But the cognitive domain is also expanding in a way. It's not that our brains are expanding and we are becoming superhuman. But by, digital, by, by Big Bang, I, I refer to the understanding of how we make decisions. So our understanding of human decision-making is far more advanced today than w it was just a few decades ago. So we know much more about how to influence people. And we use this, of course, for political technologies. We use it when you go into the supermarket. We use it for all kinds of preferences that we have to sort of shape in our everyday lives. So we know a lot about this. And the combination of insights from the digital domain, insights and data from the digital domain combined with an understanding of how the cognitive domain, the human brain, operates is super, super fascinating. And various states and other actors are looking at this and they're hoping to be the first to put together something which will really address this issue and be able to exploit it. So when you do operations like this, I try to, to sort of very briefly uh, give you an understanding of it. So we have a sender, someone who wants to achieve certain things. They want you to purchase some certain things in the supermarket or perhaps go on holiday or whatever. They want you to vote for a particular party. So there will be a sender which sends communication to the recipient and will have a cognitive effect. So it's important that there is this intentionality. So there has to be a cognitive effect. You need to think about this. What is it that I want to achieve with this? I want people to vote yes or no in the referendum. I want to, uh, people to abstain from taking part in the referendum. I want them to vote for this party or whatever. This, of course, is the difficult part. So there's lots of information, lots of senders, lots of recipients, but we do not necessarily see a cognitive effect. It may be an immediate and then a final cognitive effect that could be an immediate and then a subsequent effect and a final effect at the end. But this is a really difficult uh, task. You need to understand how to, how to open the door to the cognitive domain for it to have an effect. Uh, we may refer to this as a situationality. So it's a context-based understanding of what kind of information you need to send. So you're looking, what you're lo really looking is at is how, what is it that I want to achieve? Then you put together your information, you choose your platform and then you send it and then you hope that it will work. What is interesting about the combination of the digital and cognitive domains, as I said, is that because we now have so much more information in the digital domain, we may harvest much more that we can use to unlock the doors. So through the digital domain, we will know much more about how voters think about certain issues. So we are actually providing the information ourselves, which is very, very interesting. But this is the difficult part. How to open, 
how to unlock the door to uh, to the cognitive domain and and uh, achieve the cognitive effect that you're looking at. Then, of course, as I said in the introduction, some of it is disinformation. There's lots of focus on disinformation because there's a lot of it, and also because it seems that it's it crosses a line. Of course, some of the disinformation that we see is so is so cynical. It's so. It's so blatant lies that it is really difficult for us to understand. It has consequences, of course, for our political systems. It has consequences for our political communication, the dialogues that we conduct within our political system. So it has far-reaching consequences. And for that, of course, we need to discuss it. We need to be aware of it. But a lot of it, and still more, I suspect, will be regular information, which will be used in a very particular instrumentalized way in order to achieve these effects. I'll give you an example. This is from a Russian textbook. Uh, again, it's not to speak about Russia, but this is from a Russian textbook, and it illustrates the point. So you have this huge rock. It's well situated. And they explain that in order to move the rock, you need to uh, apply energy. It's kinetic energy. Uh, you need to apply a certain amount of kinetic energy in order to move this rock. The same goes for a political system. So if you have a group of voters and you would like to move them, then you need to apply energy. But energy does not come in the form of kinetic energy, it comes in the form of information. So you need to inject into the political system information that contains enough energy for the population to move where you want them to move. And this is a, an illustration. Sometimes you want the rock to move, you want the population, the voters to move. Sometimes you want them to stay where they are. Then you use another type of energy. And I try to illustrate it. So, as I said, move first and then consolidate. It doesn't have to be like that. But the idea is to move, these represent, it's not a cheese, these represent the voters. Yeah? So you're moving the voters from one part of the political arena to another part. And once you have moved them to where you would like them to be, you consolidate. So first you inject energy through information to move them, and once they have arrived at where you would like them to be, you use energy to keep them there. That energy also comes through information. And so the idea is to keep this balance. So First you move them, then you keep the balance and you keep them where you are. Now Adam talked about this in the introduction. And we have examples, of course, how to uh, move, move uh, voters. We have examples of how to move minority groups and so on. And once you have moved them to where you would like them to be, you keep them there. That is also challenging. It's also difficult. Um, and again, you need to unlock the door to the cognitive domain to move them, but also to keep them there. And you should keep in mind, of course, also that once they're there, they may be subjected to other types of information. This is also why when we look, for instance, at authoritarian or even more so, of course, totalitarian states, they're very concerned about how to keep an information free or a, 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 an information space that is free from foreign influence. Because the more you control the information space, the easier it is to move people and the easier it is to keep them where you would like them to be. So if you don't have sort of cross inferences, you don't have cross information, it's much easier. We also learn from some of these technologies that you need what I call the situationality in order to unlock uh, the door to the cognitive domain. You need to, in to inject information which is new, important, relevant, and often with the question, who is the guilty one? You don't necessarily ask the question, but it's implied in the information that someone is to blame for this situation. Whether it's the European Union, or it's US elections, or it's a situation within the state where we would see genocide, for instance, someone is to blame for something that has happened. You don't necessarily point out who these people are, but it's something which is implied in the information. We also learn that uh, often it's very, uh, profitable for senders to only give part of the information. Russian scholars speak about this. It's important you don't provide all the information. You only provide one, two, three, and then the recipient will put together one, two, three, and say four. This is also hugely interesting for those of us who work on, on the uh, effect of information operation, because it makes it difficult for us to truly assess the, uh, the effect. <coughs> what it mirrors is what we call an endogenous preference formation. So people who arrive at, at a particular political preference do not realize that they have been influenced because they said four themselves. No one told them to say four. They only said one, two, three, and then you utter four, and you have done it by yourself. So you're not really aware of the fact that you've been influenced. And this promises to make the effect greater 
uh, more uh, long-lasting. It also promises to make it much harder for people to unwind this particular process and say this is where it originated, in Russia or in another state or with a particular group. They also say, as part of this, if you really want to inject energy into the system, you want to move people around, you want to ask this question, who's the guilty one? You make, want them to make the conclusion, draw the conclusion, they did it. The more you can create a gap between reality and illusion, the more energy you can inject into the system. And what is interesting, people who work on these technologies and who do research on this and who give advice on how to use it, what is interesting and you should keep in mind is that the information operation, it could be disinformation, but the information operation is the new reality. The long-held belief about how a system operates is now the illusion. And the greater the gap between the new reality and the old illusion, or what used to be reality, the greater the gap, the more energy it will provoke and the more it can move people around. We also know, this would be my final point on, on this before I just try to wrap up, the recipient will be economical with the information. Yeah? Uh, the recipient will try to store this in as few categories as is meaningful, meaningfully possible. And this is just how we operate, because we receive so much information. We need boxes inside our brain to store the information, and we would like to be economical, so we don't have too many boxes inside. And they will use this. So we have certain cases, instances of this and this and that. It's provided to us. We say four. It says one, two, three. Our reply is four, and we put it down here, or we put it down here. Sometimes you will see people who only have one category. These are people who believe in conspiracy theories. And there are lots of people, and of course a lot of the information that we see in the campaigns, they focus on conspiracy theories, and they are fed by conspiracy theories, and they feed conspiracy theories. And you will see people who only have one category. And it says, for instance, the state did it, or this particular minority group did it, or something else. But these are conspiracy theories. So we'll try to be economical, and the information operation will try as best as it can, to direct you to put this information in a particular case. Yeah. So if something has happened, let's say the economy is not improving or there has been unrest in a particular area or whatever, then they would like you to draw the conclusion that it, the information belongs in this group, the state is behind it, or this particular minority group is behind it, or a foreign state has, has interfered or whatever it is. So, just to wrap up in this, uh, I'll leave you with this. This is a quote from a Russian uh, book on, on how to influence people. So, it's, it says, and I've highlighted a few words, uh, that information war, Russians speak about information war, it may be conducted continuously, anonymously, and unnoticed. So, if you put this together in a very clever way, you may go unnoticed, largely unnoticed, at least in the public domain. It has to do with the opponent's consciousness. The opponent may not necessarily recognize that he has been the subject of an attack or external control. So it has to do with how to influence people from the distance and how to influence people in a way where they do not realize that they've been influenced. And um, with that, uh, I will leave you um, and we'll continue um, going into more details. For those of you who are interested, uh, this is a piece that I wrote on the weaponization of information. And this is where I live, if any of you have any comments uh, or questions that you would like to share. So thank you for this. Thank you, Fleming. <laughs> yeah, please. Yeah, thank I think this intervention was also very interesting because it sort of sets the stage, as I also said in the introduction, for some of the mechanisms through which mm, some of these political technologies at least wish to obtain an effect. And now we move on to... Emily, you can come up. <laughs> okay. To uh, it's a bit rude to say someone who spends more time on Twitter. <laughs> I don't know whether that's true. You spend time on Twitter too, Fleming. <laughs> Sometimes, but Emily, you will present the uh, the work. So please, the floor is yours for approximately twenty minutes. I will try my best to stay within that time frame. Um, so hi, uh, my name is Emily Henley. I'm from the Oxford Internet Institute. 
I'm a grad student there and also a researcher within the COMPROP project and COMPROP stands for Computational Propaganda Research Project, which broadly investigates the interaction of algorithms, automation and politics. Within that research project, I am working on an annual report called the Global Cybertroops Report, which this year we have called the Global Disinformation Order, because quite frankly, it is turning more and more global. As Adam mentioned before this year, we have included 70 countries within our report. Um, so we're growing each year. We started two years ago, we were at around 27. Last year we had about 48 and this year we're up to 70. So um, to give you a general idea of what we're doing within this report, um, basically we write country-based case studies and then put all of that together into one shiny little report that you can all access online that hopefully um, gives you all the information that we have found in a more digestible way than country-based case studies. And those case studies are based on content analysis, so we mainly look at newspapers there and uh, think tanks and other uh, non-governmental organizations uh, that are active within different countries to see what they have been observing uh, when it comes to disinformation and uh, inf uh, manipulation of public opinion online. Um, and then we also consult the literature, obviously, uh, write a case study based on that and then consult experts within each country to make sure that we're representing the situation in each country appropriately. Um, now, cyber troops particular for us is defined as uh, a government or political party actor uh, which is tasked with manipulating public opinion online. Most of our research focuses on disinformation rather than just information more generally, but um, obviously this can take several different forms and depending on where you are, uh, you will see different types of activities. Um, and for, for my presentation, I will give you two slides that will give you some general um, overviews of what we found this year um, and what we found last, the last few years as well. And then I will look more specifically into the Global South um, and I uh, will give you a little overview of, of several countries that will give you a sort of flavor of what we will find when it comes to disinformation and uh, misinformation online within the Global South. So the first finding um, that has is not really new, um, but is repeating throughout each year, is that Facebook is essentially the number one platform, social media fl platform on which you will find um, misinformation activities. Uh, a side note on that is that even though globally it is not that big, what we found in last years, especially in the case studies we've been doing for the 2019 report, is that direct messaging services such as WhatsApp or also the direct messaging um, uh, services from WeChat are becoming more and more influential and that's a bit of a problem because public uh, social media platforms such as Facebook or Twitter are much easier accessibly from the outside and it's easier to trace the types of information and the types of activities that are going on there whilst with platforms such as WhatsApp which are encrypted we can see the activities but we have no idea about the content and at the same time um, you can find that people are tend to believe that a little bit more because even though WhatsApp has a feature of mass messaging. It still appears to you as if you've been directly messaged. So people tend to believe that much more and it's been used quite effectively. So a recent example within Europe uh, would be the left-wing party Podemos within Spain, uh, who has used uh, WhatsApp in particular quite actively to spread their messages. I will get back to that in a little bit uh, in relation to the Global South as well. And then our next general finding, giving you a few percentages here, uh, as you can see, 6% of the countries that we are, have included in our report really use these chat applications. So it's not that big of a deal comparably to the other percentages yet. But um, generally, when they are used, they are quite influential and that is becoming more and more prevalent. Um, so yeah, other than that, uh, the, most, the most common strategies will are remaining human-operated fake accounts as well as any types of trolling and harassment or doxing. So searching up information of p private individuals, uh, putting it out there and just harassing people with that um, as a form of mainly pushing down political dissent or political opposition and sort of staying within your own narrative and pushing that to the forefront and discrediting any sort of opposition that you might have. So specifically for this talk, I was asked to um, give you an idea of sort of the, the uh, manipulation landscape that we find within the Global South. And so um, I've chosen for this to focus on these particular countries. And there is 
two reasons for my choices here. One is time constraint, obviously. Uh, if I would talk about all countries that we have in our report, we will probably be still be here by tomorrow. Um, and the other reason is also that I wanted to give you an idea of the different geographical regions uh, and different capacity levels. So all of these countries uh, have a different level of capacity when it comes to cyber troops. Uh, and I will give you more details on that later uh, and come from different geographical regions to give you an over overview of sort of where you will find what and what that entails in terms of activities you would find there. Um, but first, uh, I will talk about um, something that I feel like or we found in our research is something that a lot of people think is the most common thing ever. If we talk about misinformation operations, people tend to be like, oh, so like Russia trying to push something on us and like, not really. There are some countries who are involved in foreign influence operations, but really there's not a lot. And if you look at the countries here, which are all the countries from our report that we have found to be engaging in foreign influence operations, it's somewhat of a global south phenomenon because every, except for Russia, all of these countries here are from the global south. Now, there is a possibility that that is because this is the only evidence we could find and other actors and other countries are engaging with this, um, but they're just more subtle and more sneaky about it. But there's also a good chance that this is what we're currently looking at. Um, and the intentions for why these different countries um, engage in influence, foreign influence operations are quite diverse. So, for example, from these countries here, um, Saudi Arabia and China would be examples of countries that have recently been quite active internationally trying to control narratives of incidents that have gained international um, attention. So for China, that would be the Hong Kong protests that have been going on for not yet a year, but for a long time that have obviously stirred some international debate and they've been trying to control the kind of narratives and reportings internationally of that incident. And for Saudi Arabia, um, that would recently have been the uh, murder of Jamal Khashoggi, which has caused quite some backlash for them and trying to sort of control, damage control the, the, the image problems that they will have with that. Um, and then on the other hand, we have countries such as Venezuela, where we found large botnets meddling with several elections throughout the world. Though this is an example where we're not entirely clear whether that is actually controlled by the Venezuelan government, because these botnets seem to be um, essentially rented out to whomever wants them. And recently, uh, they've been active in elections in Spain, and we think they have been controlled by Russia for that particular incident. So it's not entirely clear whether these botnets, for example, are related to the government in the country that they're hosted in. It's just that that's where they're from, but potentially they've been controlled by somebody else again, even though they've, host they've been hosted in a particular country. So it gets quite complicated <laughs> uh, the more you look into it. So this is uh, my main big slide. So it'll be there for a while. So take time to look at all of the information. I will talk you through uh, what all of this essentially means. So uh, starting with some terminology, we generally look within our report at four different things, which is for once the kind of um, organizations we, will f we find that engage in, inf um, in online manipulation. We look at the kind of accounts that are being used for these activities. We look at the um, main communication strategies or messaging strategies and yeah, communication strategies. So for once how they valence their messages, but also what kind of, what types of messages they use to begin with. And so for uh, what, I've, what I've given you here is an overview of, of the main organizational forms. So we have here governmental agencies, political parties, uh, private contractors, civil societies, as well as citizens who've been directly paid uh, to engage in any sort of uh, misinformation or, or just information um, sharing online. Um, and for that part of the table, I have a little bit of a color code here. Essentially, the darker the color, the more of these types of uh, organizations we found. So for the very dark blue, that would be three or more of these types of organization within a particular country. Um, can you even see this? There's a lighter shade of blue, which is two. You can see it? Okay. Uh, which is two uh, types, uh, two organizations of that particular type that we found in a specific country. And then the lightest blue, which is like, I don't know if you can see this, these ones here. Oh, oh well. Unfortunate. Um, that is one organization of that type that we found within a particular country. Now, for citizens, they don't have a color code because it's quite hard to tell how many citizens exactly have been engaged uh, by a particular government. So if you find a shading there, which is also very light, but I think it's visible, that just means we found citizens being paid within that country. But how many, we can't really tell at this point. 
And then the other part of this table uh, gives you an overview of the types of accounts that are being used within each of these countries. So as you can see, th the two most common types of accounts that are being used are bots and human accounts. And um, what is interesting here is that even though all of these countries are from the global south, the kind of pattern that you see here is the kind of pattern you will find in our re uh, re research results more generally. Um, so internationally, with all the 70 countries that we looked at, bots and human accounts are the most used accounts that you will find uh, within uh, governmental misinformation operations. And then when it comes to, um, uh, lastly, oh my god, those colors are not there at all. This is so sad. Okay, so I think I can see it on here, so we'll try and recreate it. Essentially, the uh, last four countries here are countries that are all, uh, for us, are grouped within a low-capacity cyber troop uh, activities. Uh, and that essentially means these are countries that only have um, temporary teams that are usually only engaged throughout elections or any type of ref referendum, and outside of election cycles, they are no longer active. And then the next five countries, so up until here, um, these are all countries that have a medium capacity uh, for cyber troops and that usually includes more consistent teams that are engaged year-round uh, different types of, uh, of of communication strategies being used and experimented with um, and yeah we have yeah multiple uh, full-time staff and multiple types of strategies that are being used and then from up here up until the top these are uh, high capacity actors when it comes to cyber troop activities and that includes very large teams uh, large budgets, both for psychological operations and information warfare more generally, uh, as well as ones for research um, and to s yeah, for multiple types of actors and multiple types of, of, of accounts being used uh, to see what works and how you can best influence. Uh, so essentially what, what you've been talking about in your talk, uh, these countries have money to research exactly that, how to put together um, the cognitive and the digital sort of domain and really influence people in the most efficient way. And then finally, two other things uh, that, that we look at here is uh, the, the common sort of valence strategy or messaging strategy, which for most countries, including all of the countries in this sample except for Israel, um, is the attack of opposition or dissenting opinions. Um, which also internationally is the most used strategy. Most countries will engage in some form, uh, or essentially it's, it's mainly actually political parties that will engage in some form of attacking oppositional uh, parties and dissenting opinions to make sure that it's only their opinion and, and their sort of narrative being told. Um, Israel, as I said here, is the only exception, and they engage mainly in some version of pro-governmental or pro-party uh, messaging which is also internationally and within the Global South, the second most common strategy. Now, what is interesting about Israel is that um, they use computational propaganda more generally as a form of international diplomacy, you could say. Um, and so they, they don't just see it as something you can do within a particular sort of sets of, of, of examples or, or sets of issues, but it's really something that they use as a broader diplomatic effort to represent themselves uh, both domestically and also internationally. And they engage in something else that is uh, becoming increasingly more common, which is uh, they try to increase their sort of uh, their, their political power uh, by supporting other countries with technology, whether that is software or hardware. So a recent example here would be, for example, would be Kenya, who have bought spyware and other types of software from an Israeli intelligence company. Um, to support their own activities within within that area. Now, it is not entirely clear whether this particular company is actually uh, connected to the Israeli government, but it is very likely that that is the case. And Israel is not the only country of the Global South who is engaging in these kind of activities. Um, China is also one of the main actors who has been doing that quite actively in the last few years. So they've been going around and just supporting countries with hardware, with software, with anything you can really think of, whether that is money or something very specific, um, to support them in their own law enforcement efforts. That's what it's officially called. Uh, but it's really a way for them to get more and more power and, s and increase their power and make sure that they potentially also have access to all of the information uh, that is being pass through the technology and then the software that they provide to other countries. So this is something you will find, especially in African countries, quite a bit that they have technology and software that is coming from outside, um, mainly provided by countries such as uh, China and Israel, who have high, quite high capacities when it comes to technology to begin with. 
So um, the other, the last thing that we look at is communication strategies more generally. Um, and that usually we find for most of these countries means the creation of some form of disinformation and the manipulation of media, uh, which is not just for the global south, but again, internationally, the most common used strategy. And the second most used strategy is some version of harassment and trolling. Um, so all of that brings us to the conclusion that really the kind of landscape that you will find when it comes to disinformation in the global south in developing countries is not that different from what you would find in western countries generally speaking uh, and some of the most powerful actors when it comes to cyber troop capacities are actually from the global south so don't underestimate them um, there's one sort of difference i want to highlight here that goes again generally speaking to give you an overview and that is the kind of control capacities that you will find in different countries so what I mean with that is that most of these countries, and I'll give some specific examples, what you would find where, um, have some version of control over either the internet backbone within their country or major media broadcasters, which is something you will generally not find within democratized and Western countries. And they can use that kind of control to their own benefit in ways that, again, you would probably not find in more Western countries. And that means essentially that, for example, um, yeah, well, Cuba here is a good example, uh, which essentially has control of all main media broadcasters within its country and also international internet access is very, very, very low, which means that most of the information and most of the narratives that citizens there are confronted with are controlled directly by the government. Uh, something very similar is going on in South Africa and Sudan and also the United Arab Emirates, where the governments essentially have control of major media broadcasters through very interesting family ties that are if you if you ever have a Sunday night time, just read up on it. It's quite f fascinating, really. Um, or you can look at our case studies. We report on that there as well. And then lastly, uh, from this sample, Egypt and Zimbabwe are two countries, um, two examples of countries that have control over the internet backbone within their countries. And they use that uh, to shut down the internet where they see fit. A very recent example of that comes from Zimbabwe, where at the end of 2018, there was a fuel so shortage within that region, which hit Zimbabwe quite hard. And one of the ways that citizens decided to deal with that or, or coped with that was by using WhatsApp quite heavily, <laughs> direct messaging services coming back to us again. And what happened essentially is that they coded a chatbot uh, that you could message and tell them your location. And then the chatbot would tell you uh, where you would find fuel nearest from the location location that you're coming from. Um, other than that, WhatsApp was also used to, to organize protests of the sh uh, fuel shortage in general. And um, the Zimbabwean government really did not like that. Um, so they ended up trying to shut down WhatsApp, which was semi-successfully eventually went back up. But at least for a while, there was no access to that platform, which was quite a problem for people who were relying on it to find fuel. Um, OK. so. Very last slide. I think we have one and a half minutes left. That was timed perfectly. <laughs> so um, this is the last slide that I want to leave you with, essentially, which gives you some more concrete numbers. Now, these are I've included actors here, so Myanmar and Syria included here that were not on the previous slide. These are all the actors we have in the global south, which we currently deem as high capacity cyber troop actors. Um, and so I wanted to give you some really concrete numbers so you have an idea of, of what we're talking about here. And as you can see, uh, capacities do very much vary. So for example, in Syria, we have contracts that are valued at around 4,000 US dollars versus uh, the United Arab Emirates, where we're talking several million uh, US dollars. So even within this sort of permanent cyber troop activity, high capacity uh, group of, of, of actors, we have quite some differences when it comes to, to the kind of force and the money that comes with that. Um, that is essentially all <laughs> for me. Um, here are some resources. I'm happy to share these slides with you. You can also email me if you want to. But generally, if you go to our main link here um, and then just look for Cybertroops or go to our recent publications, uh, you will find all of these reports, which includes the Cybertroop report that I've just been talking about. We also have case studies, including longer reports on, on more bigger countries such as China, Israel, India, Iran, and so on, uh, that you can look up here. And we also have a more recent report in I Iran in particular that might be interesting to look at. Um, and yeah, that is it for me. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thanks. I thought that was a great overview.
we move on to Shelby now. I think it's also interesting to see sort of these middle powers who develop massive capacities and uh, then uh, sort of put them up uh, for sale very easily. Yeah, Shelby. And now we're really getting into the nitty gritty. Yeah, yeah, the floor is yours. Thanks. Hi, um, so I'm going to be talking about a report that my team put out two months ago on Russian online disinformation targeting Africa. And so our research started when we received a document from the Dossier Center, and the Dossier Center is a Russian investigative organization. And they shared with us a document that can be attributed to a firm linked to Yevgeny Prigozhin. And Yevgeny Prigozhin is a Russian oligarch with ties to Putin. And so basically this is a document where Prigozhin employees are boasting about having created 12 Facebook pages targeting Libya and in this document they helpfully include a screenshot of one of the of one of the posts that they made and from this post we were able to identify the Facebook page that it was on and using some other clues in the document we were able to identify the 12 Facebook pages that they were that they were referencing so we we read through these pages to try to figure out what was going on and we wrote up a draft blog post with our findings and we sent this to Facebook and we said hey Facebook you might want to take down these pages because they clearly violate your terms of service in terms of transparency of who's running the pages and Facebook said hey do you you know we've actually already been investigating dozens of other Facebook pages that have the same upstream actor, namely Prigozhin, would you like to analyze those as well jointly? And we said, sure. So we ended up analyzing 73 Facebook pages and seven Instagram accounts before Facebook took them down that targeted a number of African countries. And these pages were pretty popular, so they were followed by almost two million accounts, um, and they were very prolific. So in one month alone of last year, the pages posted 9,000 times. Uh, so just to tell you a little bit about substantively like what was going on in these in these pages um, so the Libya pages fell into two categories so one set of pages were supportive of Khalifa Haftar who is a rebel leader who was trying to seize uh, Tripoli and this wasn't that surprising because we already know that that various Russian actors have been have been supporting Haftar um, and then another set of pages are what I think of in my head as Muammar Gaddafi nostalgia pages so these were pages that said things like don't you guys remember how great things were under Muammar Gaddafi? And then every once in a while, there would be a post of Saif al-Islam Gaddafi, one of Muammar Gaddafi's surviving sons. Um, and it would say things like, wouldn't he make a great president? So he's seen as one possible presidential contender um, in the future. So it's kind of interesting that they're supporting both Haftar and Gaddafi because these are two individuals who are seen as possible competitors if Libya holds presidential elections at any point in the future. Um, and people have different different theories for what's going on there. Some people think maybe they're trying to, to hedge and make sure they have a relationship with whoever wins. Some people think maybe they're trying to get the two to cooperate. We don't really know. Um, and many of the pages denigrated the internationally recognized prime minister. And this is a cartoon suggesting that his time is running out. Um, and so this is just a plot that shows uh, the x-axis is time, the y-axis is total page followers, and each line is one of the Libya pages. And you can see that they follow this very similar trend, which suggested to us that they are being managed by the same entity. Um, and the staircase kind of nature of the plot is interesting, which suggests that either they were purchasing followers or they were, they were running ads um, around the same time for all of the pages. And so one question that we tried to ask ourselves after we had um, you know, looked at this dossier document, I, we knew these pages were linked to Prigozhin, we tried to think, would we have been able to figure out on our own that these pages were linked to Russia without having had this, this document? And in short, the answer is no. So uh, one, uh, feature, one kind of Facebook functionality that people often use to try to figure out what's going on with the sketchy page is what's called the page transparency feature. So if you're ever on a Facebook page, there's this little button like right over here called page transparency, and it gives you Facebook's best guess at the location of the page administrators. So this is different than the self-declared location of the administrators. It's Facebook using special secret Facebook data to try to figure out where the admins are actually located. 
And so if you were to have clicked on the page transparency button for these Libya pages, you would have just seen a plurality of admins in Egypt. And there's reason to think that these pages were being managed by an Egyptian digital marketing firm. So even like a savvy Libyan citizen who's taking advantage of page transparency is just going to see, see Egypt. Um, also, kind of another strategy you can often use is to look at the types of websites that the page is linking to. So if like a Twitter account is always tweeting links to RT and Sputnik content, that tells you something. But in this case, they were pretty sophisticated in that they almost never linked out to, to websites. So we couldn't use that as a, as a strategy. Um, and there was like a pro-Russia slant across a lot of the pages, but you really had to look for it. It wasn't like always in your face. Um, yeah. So, okay, the Central African Republic pages briefly. So this was a hyper-partisan set of pages that were generally supportive of the CAR government and uh, critical of France. So this is a, a cartoon that one of the pages called Bengui Buzz posted uh, that has the French president speaking to Putin and saying, Vladimir, I demand that you cancel the Sochi summit for African heads of state. Don't you know Africa is mine? Um, and then one of the pages created a Google form that was ostensibly trying to elicit public opinion about the Khartoum Agreement, which was a, a peace accord for CAR. Um, but actually, it was just trying to push their own agenda, which was support for the Khartoum Agreement. And this Google form had comically biased questions. So it would have questions like, do you think uh, CAR should sign the Khartoum Accord, or do you think the country needs more casualties? And then the option would be sign Khartoum Accord or country needs more casualties. Um, and so 18 of the 73 pages that we reviewed targeted Sudan, and several of the Facebook pages were linked to actual Sudanese news websites that employed actual Sudanese reporters. So these were called Khartoum Star and Sudan Daily. So this is a screenshot of a Facebook post from Khartoum Star. And uh, I read through so many of these, uh, these posts. So these, the Sudan pages started while Bashir was still in power. They persisted through the coup, through the Transitional Military Council, through the Sovereign Council of Sudan. And I read through posts around kind of all of those events on both Facebook and on the news websites, and I couldn't find any bias. You know, you might have thought, well, maybe like around the time that there were these, these protests against Bashir, there would have been like anti-protester content, but there was not. And so it's not totally clear what was going on with the Sudan pages. Um, one theory is that they were, these Russian actors were investing in like the long-term credibility of these news outlets. And then when an event came along that they wanted to try to push their own agenda on, they would have really gone in strong on that event. But that's just, that's just speculation. Um, this is a screenshot from Khartoum Star, the website. Uh, and then the Sudan pages also include pages that at first glance could appear to be the like official page of the various Sudanese governments that have existed over the past year and a half. So this is a page where the handle is literally at Transitional Military Council. Um, and so, you know, it's not totally clear like what they were ultimately trying to, to do with these pages. Um, yeah. And then the Mozambique pages were really straightforward. So the Mozambique pages were created in September of last year. They existed exclusively to support the ruling for Lima party in advance of elections that happened in October. Uh, so there would be posts that would be like a photo of the incumbent president holding a rally with like a big crowd, that kind of stuff. OK, so some key takeaways. Uh, so. The main finding is that these Russian actors are increasingly franchising out their disinformation operations. So I mentioned that the Libya pages were managed by this Egyptian digital marketing firm. The Sudan pages employed actual Sudanese reporters. And this matters because it means that they're increasingly able to create content that is, feels locally authentic and resonates with people. So when the Internet Research Agency meddled in you know, US social media in advance of the 2016 elections, that whole operation was based in St. Petersburg. And so as a result, like the quality of the English wasn't that great. So if you looked at if you look at some of those IRA posts now, you kind of can see that it wasn't written by a native English speaker. But by franchising out these operations, you can create kind of more authentic content. And this also makes it much harder for us to identify these that these operations are, are linked to Russia when they are so kind of locally embedded. 
Uh, second, generally we found that the pages existed to support the ruling party, maybe to curry favor with uh, political, el political elites because we know that Prigozhin has mining interests throughout Africa. Um, one of the pages in the data set that Facebook gave us was for a Malagasy mining company that Prigozhin has links to. And so Facebook didn't say anything about what was going on with this page. And the page was empty. It has no posts. But that suggests that mining might have been part of this somehow. Uh, we found basically no fake news. It was just like hyper-partisan content, like kind of cheerleading content for various, for various politicians. Um, also, I think, you know, sometimes we have in our head this notion of like citizens just passively absorbing, uh, you know, disinformation on social media. And, you know, we did see like some of that with these pages, but we did also see citizens responding skeptically to this content. So particularly in Libya, on the Muammar Gaddafi nostalgia pages, you'd often see people responding with things like, surely you didn't live under Gaddafi, because if you did, you wouldn't be saying these silly things. Um, and for Mozambique, so the one fake news story we found across like thousands and thousands of posts was in Mozambique. And this was a fake news story suggesting that the opposition party in Mozambique had signed a contract with the government of China to allow China to dispose of nuclear waste in Mozambique. And people responded to the story by saying things like fake news, exclamation point, exclamation point in Portuguese. Um, one person responded, I think you're like tinfoil hat is wound too tight around your head. You know, this can't be true. Um, and I think, you know, it's contested whether all of this had any sort of impact, um, but we did see like local citizens engaging with this content at fairly high levels. Okay, so very briefly, um, I think the Russian response to all of this was pretty interesting. So our report comes out, Facebook does this takedown, they do a little their own little blog post about it. Um, and then we see this article come out on, I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's I think riafon.ru, which is a news outlet that people have told me is linked to Prigozhin. Um, and so the, the headline for this article is political censorship on Facebook has reached a new level, Africa has come under attack. So the idea being Facebook is censoring African voices. Um, and they included in the article a screenshot um, from our report. And this is a table that we made that was just showing for all of the Libya pages, the location of the page administrators to show that there were a pl plurality of page admins in Egypt for all of the pages. And they use this to say, look, like Russia isn't anywhere. This is like an Egyptian thing. Um, and to me, I, I interpret this as like they're, they're being very intentional with their strategy to franchise out this operation because they, they know it gives them this plausible deniability. Um, and then there were, so these, these Sudanese reporters who were working for Khartoum Star and Sudan Daily uh, tweeted at, at me and at Facebook people um, saying things like they tried to get these hashtags trending. I'm from Sudan. I am Khartoum Star. I am a Sudanese citizen working on the Khartoum Star on Facebook. Recently, I moved to Russia for the purpose of studying the Facebook administration believed that the page was related to Russian activity in Africa. And the reason is because I'm in Russia. Um, and so, you know, we're not sure to what extent these Sudanese reporters knew what was going on. Uh, there's some reason to think they did, um, but our hope kind of is that reporters dig more into this. And I actually think some reporters are looking into this right now. Um, and so last, I thought I'd just talk about some of the um, fun tools that we use that anyone can use. Uh, so the really one of the most useful tools we use is CrowdTangle. It's a free Chrome extension plugin. Uh, CrowdTangle is a product owned by Facebook. They have a paid platform that we also use, but this is like a free service. And with CrowdTangle, if you come across like a sketchy website and you're like, I don't really know what's going on with this website, if you click on CrowdTangle, it will show you the social media referrals to the website. So if you come across like some weird news website for Malaysia and you click on CrowdTangle and it shows that like Vladimir Putin fan groups on Facebook are linking to it, like that's, that's useful information. Um, also the page transparency feature that I mentioned, Facebook's ad library was not working, was, they had not opened it up for, for Africa when we wrote this report two months ago, but it is now open, I think for all countries, uh, at least for the African countries that I've looked at. And so if you're ever on, um, so you go on a Facebook page, you click on page transparency and it will show you if the page is running ads. And if it is, you can click on it and it will show you, it will take you to the ad page and you can see exactly what ads they're running. This has been extremely helpful for some ongoing projects my team has um, over the past few months. 
Um, and then last, uh, TweetDeck, which is just a free Twitter product, has been really useful for my team. It just allows you to kind of search Twitter. So if you come across a hashtag that looks weird, you can use TweetDeck to very quickly look at the first instance of the hashtag and see who was sharing that hashtag, what are some of the account attributes. Um, that can be a useful tool. Okay, so in conclusion, um, you know, I think it's important to understand what type of social media content people are consuming. But, you know, in this project, it was also useful to try to understand what the objectives were of the Russian actors that were creating this content. Um, I also have some kind of, I'm a political scientist, I have more academic projects that are trying to leverage this page transparency data. So I have a project that I think, you know, other people should be doing this kind of work as well, where we basically downloaded like the universe of public Facebook posts about an event that happened in Libya recently. And we're coding the page transparency information to try to see if there's a relationship between the location of the admins and the way they're talking about this event that happened. Um, and I think there are a lot of opportunities for deeper country specific research. So these Sudanese news web Websites are still live. They're still being updated. Um, and if anyone's interested in any of these countries, uh, we archived 100% of the posts from all of the pages that were removed. So if you want like, to see what the content was for CAR or something, I'm happy to extract that and share it for you. Um, yeah, so thanks very much. Thank you. <laughs> Shelby? Some fascinating stuff. I don't want to say moving to 2.0, but it's sort of this layering of experiences over time for some of the main, uh, what do you say, contributors in the field of uh, disinformation. And so we go on to Mr. Shouten. You forgot a mic. Thank you. Very old school. Does it work? Yes. Um, yeah, thank you for inviting me. It's really exciting to listen to these presentations. And uh, if I would have known about them before, I probably would have uh, made another presentation myself. Um, I'll be talking a little bit about uh, misinformation, uh, conspiracy theories, uh, rumors, etc., uh, in Central Africa, and looking not so much at kind of outside efforts to to engineer certain kinds of uh, cognitive pr processes or ideas, but rather the kind of fertile soil that you'll find in, in uh, countries in Central Africa uh, for these kind of, uh, of sorts of information and how they're being used uh, from below, so to speak, bottom up, to kind of um, in, in kind of political struggles. It's all very sketchy still. It's a new line of research for me, and I'll make two points. Uh, one is, I think, about the form of uh, social media, uh, mobile communications, etc., and how they kind of fit with the kind of political uh, anarchy or order that you see in, in uh, the countries where I work. Um, and second, uh, something about the content. Uh, so so what, what exactly is being, is being discussed here and how do this content, the, these kind of discussions fit with uh, broader kind of cultural beliefs and patterns uh, in Central Africa? I'm going to start with one uh, small controversy, uh, which is uh, a, a long-standing one in, in Central Africa. And uh, it's about the balkanization of Eastern Congo, uh, meaning it's partitioning for political purpose, purposes by outside forces. Now, it's a very old kind of belief in Eastern Congo that outside forces want to break up the country. It's too big to govern, and neighboring countries, the US or, or European powers, want to break it up and control the mineral rich east of, of, of Congo. Now, this controversy recently start of January actually flared up once again and it flared up in a supermarket in Uganda where uh, two uh, uh, Congolese women uh, made a YouTube video of themselves which they posted online uh, in where they take this pack of coffee from Rwanda uh, uh, called uh, the Rwanda Farmers Coffee Company and um, they show that actually the map on of Rwanda which is advertised on this package of coffee includes Eastern Congo and uh, uh, what, what their kind of running comment is, as a joke, is you see the balkanization of Congo, uh, which has been attributed to Rwanda, is, is once, uh, once again alive and active. Now, they kind of posted it as a joke, uh, but uh, in the wake of that uh, video being posted, uh, internet is kind of overtaken in Central Africa by posts continuing that discussion. So here is a post, which is uh, posted by Congolese, uh, who writes the, the kind of leaders of Congo are being uh, uh, deprogrammized actually by the, by the Rwandese. And the post reads in English, 
uh, as if it's from Rwanda, saying we are slowly moving into the regions of Beni, Lubero, Rochu, Walikale, all in Eastern Congo, where you are free to own and claim lands of your ancestors. Your security is assured by our troops and guaranteed by our people in Kinshasa. We welcome all investors, etc., etc., etc. So it's really kind of this ploy, right, of Rwanda trying to overtake Eastern Congo again. And these kind of posts, this is, this is Twitter, right, uh, this was Facebook, are being spread widely and commented on. It continues with fake news. Um, this one is a post uh, from a half year ago, a news, uh, newspaper article. Uh, in Eastern Congo, a Rwandan soldier was shot in operation secretively, right, in Eastern Congo. Um, and uh, uh, this is from a kind of news website, which is half in, in Kenya Rwanda, half in French, half in English. It's all badly translated. But these are the things that circulate uh, uh, quite a lot. You also get badly translated uh, uh, kind of news items, which are really vague and fussy, but they make associations to Emmanuel Macron, to mineral uh, riches of Eastern Congo, Western powers, uh, and so kind of keep this alive. So you might say this is just fake news. It's, it's clearly obviously fake. Uh, so, so uh, uh, you know, it's uh, probably just a local stupid thing. But actually, uh, the Congolese army has responded by putting out ads saying we are against the balkanization of Eastern Congo. Uh, the Congolese president, uh, Felix Tshisekedi, has also responded in public media uh, against uh, saying that he wants to defend his country against his balkanization by outside forces. So he's taken it up, this local controversy, as a way to boost his own agenda and popularity uh, among Congolese. And uh, even though this is all kind of a fake debate, uh, actually hundreds of villages are being burned as a result of the idea that uh, this balkanization is taking place by targeting Rwandese or rwanda farm populations in Eastern Congo as being somehow linked to this or engineered by or involved in this kind of, um, uh, this kind of balkanization uh, effort. Um, this is uh, the Rwandese uh, kind of uh, national media where the foreign minister uh, also makes a public statement saying he trashes these kind of balkanization claims uh, in the DRC. So this, uh, from a kind of very local Facebook kind of uh, YouTube uh, kind of uh, a running gag, has turned into a kind of regional political uh, controversy involving uh, heads of state and uh, very real lives uh, imperiled. Um, I think something more is going on here, which isn't just about uh, this controversy you see itself, but really, really about the truth value or the value of myth, gossip uh, and rumors in political culture in Central Africa. Uh, there's something called Radio, radio Trottoir, pavement radio, bush telegraph if you will, which is an old concept uh, for uh, people gossiping and spreading news um, uh, by themselves on the streets. Uh, President uh, Paul ba Bia of Cameroon said about this, as for the truth, many of you confuse it with rumors, but rumor is not the truth. Truth comes from above, rumors come from below. Rumor is created in unknown places, then spread by thoughtless and often malicious people. People who want to give themselves a spurious importance. Cameroonians pay no heed to the rumors which are spreading through the country. Now obviously, from the perspective of a president, of a state, this kind of monopoly control over information is very important and Central Africans have a long tradition of trying to monopolize the media. This is Mobutu Sese Seko. He loved the media. I have above in my office all four volumes of his speeches, which he made publicly. And he was often in the media, he was a very good speaker, and uh, uh, he, he really monopolized all media outlets to the point that in 1975, uh, newspapers were not allowed to mention any other name but his. Um, now, from this kind of perspective of uh, a kind of obsession with control over the circulation of information, its centralization from above, uh, radio trottoir, the circulation of rumors, is of course very subversive. And the kind of connection between uh, uh, a monopoly over information and state power has been made by anthropologists uh, writing about traditional societies and its clash with modernity. Levi Strauss, writing appears to be necessary for the centralized stratified state to reproduce itself. Writing is a strange thing. The one phenomenon which has invariably accompanied it is the formation of cities and empires. The integration into a political system, that is to say, of a considerable number of individuals into a hierarchy of castes and slaves. It seems rather to favor the exploitation than the enlightenment of mankind. But uh, from a kind of African perspective in the context of states who want to monopolize information and indeed use it to build their own kind of little fiefs and empires, uh, uh, Radio Trottoir is of course a tool of power and resistance. 
uh, writes uh, the Malian uh, Touré Keita, gossip is the vengeance of the populace against every establishment that rules in secret and hiding its real intentions. And indeed in Eastern Congo, if you move fast forward to today, Facebook, uh, social media, WhatsApp are being used to organize kind of positive resistance against regimes. Here is an ad by an organization called La Lucha, uh, calling on people to kind of uh, demonstrate against uh, 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 taxation by the state without any kind of service uh, uh, in, in, in return. And here they also organized an event saying bye bye Kabila to the last president, also to demonstrate against his uh, extension of power. So if you look at information hierarchies and the way that they're distributed, uh, a centralized kind of information system from one center trying to spread information, that's the model of the state. Uh, and then of course there's other kinds of ways of, of spreading information which are de decentralized and distributed and they correspond I want to suggest two kind of forms of rule, um, the Leviathan being the centralized state, and then in Eastern Congo, to give a kind of other kind of, uh, the, the, the other far end is Eastern Congo, where there's 120 different armed groups, a very fragmented civil society, uh, ethnic divides, language divides, and people which have very different kind of local uh, agendas and interpretations of facts. So obviously you will have a kind of plurality of opinions, viewpoints, and interpretations of events circulating. Now in my own research I've seen how important for these armed groups, rebels and different kinds of social networks they're embedded in, social media and communications are. This is a rebel leader I was uh, meeting and who's sitting constantly with two phones. His assistants hold uh, more phones for him, always uh, online and uh, communicating uh, in the bush. Uh, I have also rebel friends on WhatsApp who use WhatsApp really a lot to kind of stay in touch with people, send encrypted messages and promote their agendas by forwarding in mass forwarding groups, uh, kind of uh, uh, ideological conspiracy theory ideas which are in line with their own kind of uh, interests. Um, Instagram is also being used to uh, sell illegal minerals from Central Africa, uh, traders outside of rebel controlled zones, marketing the minerals online and then being sold to, to uh, uh, marketeers in, in other countries. And in a kind of a uh, dark turn of, turn of events, Facebook uh, and mobile phones together, fake Facebook accounts have been used to set up the assassination of two UN uh, expert researchers in Eastern Congo, whereby uh, soldiers would set up face fake Facebook accounts, uh, uh, trying to mimic being civil society, getting in touch with people who knew these people and eventually with themselves to be able to track their uh, movements. Um, the second point I want to make is uh, a bit more elusive, I think. It's about the political functions of myth, uh, rumors, uh, fake news and conspiracies like the Balkanization uh, thesis. And one way of making that point is by saying people don't really care about the truth in Eastern Congo because the truth, there's no kind of paper reality which is the background to their experience historically uh, to mediate that truth. Uh, truth is something which is produced socially in interaction and being redefined in terms of new relations of power as uh, events on the ground evolve. Um, my My Rebels, there's about uh, 100 uh, My My groups in Eastern Congo, believe uh, that bullets cannot kill them. They believe that they have protective fetishes which protect them against diseases. Uh, and they believe in all kinds of spirit worlds which for an outside observer are just plain ridiculous. Uh, there have been instances where my, my soldiers have invited people to shoot at them to prove that bullets could not kill them. In at least one case that uh, turned out very unfortunate for the person uh, who, who did that. Um, but these kind of beliefs in the kind of spirit world, in things which are not true, uh, are socially shared uh, among the communities from which they hail, and are being used to organize violent events. In this case, uh, uh, one quote I have one evening in 2012, an elder of the village Bulambika had a dream. In this dream, the ancestors of his tribe taught him to use supernatural forces to bulletproof the young men in the village and help them confront the source of the village insecurity. Fast forward, he does that, he kind of initiates these people and he motivates the young people of the village to attack the Rwanda phone, the balkanization link, uh, the Rwanda phone communities next door. The villagers only had machetes and their gris gris, their kind of protective charms, to fight the FDLR. 
Over time, they began to kill their enemies, from whom they eventually also obtained firearms. So myths, things which are definitely not true, um, uh, helped in fact to motivate and to obtain real world strategic kind of objectives. And the balkanization, the the balkanization kind of thesis, uh, other kinds of fabricated myths, interpretations of events which are not true, fulfill a really uh, concrete social purpose in Central Africa. And paying attention to rumors is thus uh, very important to kind of understand why people are doing what they are doing. There is truth to the balkanization uh, thesis. Uh, 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 in the, the Second Congo War, Congo was practically divided, uh, Eastern Congo, between networks of power from Rwanda on the one side and Uganda on the other. So this kind of in Central Africa. And the kind of myths that are fabricated around them today uh, reflect concerns of local populations in which they try to kind of rearticulate their strategies of resistance, uh, cohesion and survival in relation to dominant agendas. They're not just smoke screens by rebels to hide their real objectives, but a, they are a way of connecting to societies in which the kind of truth value of facts has always been contested. Um, even their own lineages armed groups, they can change name from one week to another, they can move around, call themselves differently, uh, uh, they change all the time. James Scott, the kind of uh, theor theorist of resistance, has written about such kind of moves. The shorter the genealogies of people and their histories, the less they have to explain and the more they can invent on the spot. So this is a kind of different way of looking at truth, not as something we have to hold on to, because it's the most kind of valuable thing there is, but as something flexible, something inherent to struggles over power, uh, livelihoods, and ultimately uh, survival. I think that was it. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre. That was very interesting. I think uh, yeah, for many reasons, but not least because you sort of maybe make, what can we say, make circular these domains that Fleming also talked about to sort of see the digital affecting the cognitive, but the cognitive very much affecting the physical uh, realm, sort of the the real world, so to speak. We have uh, a few minutes for questions. So please, if anyone have any questions they would like to have asked, uh, otherwise, otherwise I would say thank you to all of the speakers. Should we give a hand to everyone? <laughs> and thank you to... I will, I will say this before you leave. First of all, remember there is a glass of wine or a soda. If you want it outside, we can have discussion. I'll try to keep on to the speakers for as long as I can, and you can come and ask questions. We can have some meaningful dialogue instead of just questions going back and forth up here. But I'll also just remind you that, or say to you that um, these technologies, and including emerging technologies, is something that we do work on at these and there are other perspectives that have not been presented today that I really advise you to go and look on our web page and we will be working more on these in the coming year so hopefully if you keep an eye out for the newsletter and for the events we will have a lot of more interesting stuff so thanks for coming if you want a glass of wine or anything please go out and uh, and have a chat with everyone else so thanks <laughs>